I want to thank you again uh, for the invitation. Uh, I wrote my wife last night, and I said, I'm just having the time of my life here. <laughs> You've made me feel so welcome and uh, so responsive, and it's just a great, great privilege. Uh, we're going to do something quite differently today. It's going to certainly connect with the theme of contextualization, but uh, we're going to do a Bible study, a Bible study on Acts chapter 10. And uh, there'll be a couple... Um, there we go. And what I've called this is the conversion of a missionary. Now, that seems like a rather strange title, doesn't it? Because all missionaries are converted, right? Well, we'll see in a minute. Now, today, Christianity has become the faith of uh, two billion people in the world. In fact, you could say there are more Christians on the face of the earth than in any time in human history. That's the good news. The bad news is that... Um, there are more people who do not yet know Jesus than in any other time in history. About one-third of the world says, thank you, Jesus. Another third of the world who's heard about Jesus but says, no thank you, Jesus. And the last third of the world says, who's Jesus? We've not even heard. Well, Christianity is spreading uh, more quickly uh, in the southern hemisphere of Africa and uh, Latin America and in some places in East Asia, well, in, uh, in the East and some parts of Asia, not, not in all places. Interestingly enough, at the same time, Christianity is, is withdrawing from much of the North and the West, and these places are becoming increasingly post-Christian, post-Christian. So how did the spread of Christianity around the globe happen? How did Christianity, which simply started out among the Jews, become a universal religion? Well, I suppose in simple ways, we could say it all began with Peter and the early apostles. Peter was very reluctant to enter the world of, of the, uh, was very reluctant to enter the world of, of evangelizing Gentiles. In fact, it took Peter 11 or 12 years uh, and a supernatural vision to conclude, and I quote, God has shown me I should not call any person unholy or unclean, Acts 10:28. Now, in Peter's time, there were probably about 7 million Jews in the known world at that time, you know, essentially the Roman Empire, of about 170 million Gentiles. So how did Peter do this? Well, the conversion of a missionary. Now, those of us who are called into mission see ourselves in the business of conversion. At different periods of history, we've, uh, we've used different, uh, different language to describe this. Uh, 200 years ago, when William Carey wrote his famous pamphlet, uh, he talked about converting the heathen. And the term heathen was a popular term for, for about 100 years. Well, um, today we're inclined to talk about converting people groups or reaching hidden peoples with the gospel. The term heathen is no longer politically correct. But despite the language we use, there is this common understanding that missionaries convert others. And of course, we know that they don't. Who always does the converting? It's always the power of the Holy Spirit. But God chooses to use ordinary people like you and I in that process. Now, I want to suggest that in order to be an effective missionary, which I prefer the term a cross-cultural witness, that we must undergo two conversions. One is not enough. The first conversion is obvious. At least we assume it is. That is, we must be converted to Christ ourselves. We must be converted to Christ ourselves. <clears throat> and he must become Lord over all of our life. And only as his spirit fills us will we be empowered to lead others to Christ the Savior. You see, we need a spiritual conversion to combat our egocentrism. What do egocentric people, uh, what do egocentric people look like? What are they focused on? Just themselves. In fact, I say egocentric people come in very small packages <laughs> because they're all about themselves. Well, we need this first conversion to combat our egocentrism. Now, I say this is obvious, but even today, uh, maybe this is seen as not really a prerequisite for cross-cultural ministry. Maybe it's seen as an optional extra in some, in some mission organizations and in some circles. A number of years ago, I was doing training for um, what we would call a mainline uh, mission organization. And uh, toward the end of the week, one of the participants came up to me and said, um, 
wow, I've really enjoyed your lectures on anthropology and stuff. It's just, you, opened, you opened up a whole new world to me. But how come you keep talking about Jesus all the time? I said, where are you going and what are you going to be doing? She said, I'm going to, um, uh, to uh, Taiwan and I'm going to be teaching Buddhism in a university there. Hmm. So why did you choose to t uh, go with this particular mission organization? Oh, she said, they have a wonderful uh, study program and great travel plans. I think it's going to be a great career. This woman hadn't had the first conversion yet. Now, the second conversion for a missionary is much less obvious. This is the conversion to cross-cultural understanding and awareness. And when missionaries experience this conversion, then they begin to see the difference between the gospel and their culture. They distinguish following Jesus from adapting the, simply the cultural patterns of the missionary. And they no longer confuse the kingdom of God with the American dream. You see, we need this second conversion to combat our ethnocentrism. We need the conversion to ourselves, of ourselves, to combat our egocentrism. We have to have this cross-cultural conversion to combat our ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism means that I evaluate everything else on the basis of my own culture or on the basis of my own church, or on the basis of my own theology. And it blinds us from seeing cultural differences. Now, unfortunately, there are thousands of missionaries all over the world from many countries who have never understood the importance of this second conversion. I've studied and interviewed literally hundreds of them. So what happens is that without this second conversion, you... Uh, you have, for example, Southern Baptist missionaries in Hong Kong uh, trying to convert the Chinese into American Christians. And these Southern Baptist missionaries from Alabama who go to Hong Kong want to encourage these converts to become Southern Americans, complete with sweet tea. Or I've seen someplace else, Korean missionaries in Thailand trying to get the, the Thai people to become Cre uh, Christians in the Korean way. And, of course, introducing them to kimchi. Now, you see, we need the second cross-cultural conversion to cleanse us of our ethnocentrism. The first one, combat our egocentrism. The second conversion, to cleanse us of our ethnocentrism. Now, the importance of this cross-cultural conversion for missionaries is not a new insight uh, that comes from anthropology. Rather, it's a principle that's laid out in Scripture so clearly. We see it very clearly in Peter's interaction with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Peter had to undergo what I'm calling a cross-cultural conversion before, before he was able to lead Cornelius in conversion to Christ. So what we're going to do, we're going to read through Acts chapter 10. I'm going to be reading from the Good News Bible. Um, the other day, maybe it was yesterday or perhaps Tuesday, I encourage you to listen rather than read. Listen rather than read. I think we'll actually learn more. Okay. So, we're going to divide this up into six different scenes, and here's the first scene. Verses 1, 1 to 8. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, who was a captain in the Roman army regiment called the Italian regiment. He was a religious man. He and his whole family worshiped God. He also did much to help the Jewish poor people and was constantly praying to God. It was about three o'clock one afternoon. It was about three o'clock one afternoon when he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. He stared at the angel in fear and said, what, what, what is it, sir? The angel answered, God is pleased with your prayers and works of charity and is ready to answer you. And now send some men to Joppa for a certain man whose full name is Simon Peter. He's a guest in the home of Tanner, of a tanner of leather named Simon who lives by the sea. Then the angel went away and Cornelius called two of his house servants and a soldier, a religious man who was one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. Now here we're introduced to Cornelius. He's uh, a very imp important person in Roman society, 
Uh, he has a position in the Roman army where he's in charge of at least 100 men. Uh, it says he was devout. He prays to God constantly. Sometimes I wonder to whom was he praying? The Greek says he was praying to Theos. He was concerned for the poor and he had a social conscience. We would see Cornelius as an all-around guy, praying to God, concerned for social issues in his own community. Now we can see prevenient grace already at work because here is Cornelius, who does not yet know Jesus, in touch with God and receiving a message from God. Now we're ready for scene number two. Scene two, Peter has a weird vision. Verses 9 to 16. The next day, as they were on their way and coming near Joppa, Peter went up on the roof of the house about noon in order to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. While the food was being prepared, he had a vision. He saw heaven open and something coming down that looked like a large sheet being lowered by its four corners to the earth. In it were all kinds of animals, reptiles, and wild birds. A voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Certainly not, Lord. I've never eaten anything ritually unclean or defiled. The voice spoke to him again. Do not consider anything unclean that God has declared clean. This happened three times. And then the thing was taken back up into heaven. Now here we get a look at Peter. The Lord is obviously working with Peter because look where he's staying. He's staying in the home of a tanner. Now no good self-respecting Jew would have been caught dead <laughs> uh, living with a person who works with dead animals and turns their hides into leather. So this is significant. We're already seeing movement toward Peter's cross-cultural conversion. Now, I want you to pay attention here, because we're going to see through this chapter, Peter's cross-cultural conversion occurs step by step. It's not a road to Damascus uh, kind of conversion. It's incremental. And as we undergo this second conversion, it also will be incremental for us. Now, Peter has a shock of his life while he's up on the roof of Simon's house. He's hungry. It's time for lunch. And look what in the world he's asked to eat. Everything that is ritually unclean, that is culturally taboo, barbecued pork, French fried shrimp. Peter says, no way. I've never defiled my body by eating anything unclean. And I'm not going to start now even if I'm starving to death. But the voice keeps telling him to get up, kill one of these unclean animals, and eat it. Peter keeps protesting. And then comes the punchline, verse 15. The voice says to him, do not consider anything unclean that God has declared clean. Now, before Peter is able to get up the courage to actually eat one of these culturally unclean animals, the sheet's taken back up into heaven. Now we're ready for scene number three. Here we go. <clears throat> scene number three. Uh, Peter meets the three visitors that are sent by, by Cornelius. Verses 17 to uh, 23a. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent, uh, sent by Cornelius had learned where Simon's house was, and they were now standing in front of the gate. They called out and asked, Is there a guest here by the name of Simon Peter? Peter was still trying to understand what the vision meant when the Spirit said, listen, listen. We need to listen a lot more than we talk. Listen. Three men are here looking for you. So get ready and go down, and do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? Captain Cornelius sent us, they answered. He's a good man who worships God and is highly respected by all the Jewish people. An angel of God told him to invite you to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Peter invited the men in and had them spend the night. 
Peter's now ready to see the connection between this crazy vision he's just had on the roof of, uh, of uh, Simon's house and the three gentle, Gentile visitors now standing in front of the gate at Simon's house. The Holy Spirit tells Peter, don't drag your feet, but get ready to go with these Gentile visitors. Prejudice and bias are beginning to dissipate. They're slowly disappearing. For what does Peter do? He invites them in to spend the night. Now, what a cultural and religious scandal that would have been. For Jews to be sleeping under the same roof as Gentiles, that just was not done. But God was teaching Peter a really important lesson. Now we're ready for scene four. Verses 23b to 29, and we call that Peter at Cornelius' house. <clears throat> the next day, he got ready and went with them. And some of the believers from Joppa went along with him. Now, who are believers? Who are believers? Believers are, Jew are Jewish people, are Jews, who recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They're not Christians. Christians are Gentile followers of Jesus. Believers are Jewish followers of Jesus. So the next day, he got ready and went with them. And some of the believers from Joppa went along with him. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea where Cornelius was waiting for him, together with relatives and close friends that he had invited. As Peter was about to go in, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and bowed down before him. But Peter made him rise. Stand up, he said. I myself am only a man. Peter kept on talking to Cornelius as he went into the house, where he found the people gathered. He said to them, you yourselves know very well that a Jew is not allowed by his religion to visit or even associate with Gentiles. But God has shown me that I must not consider any person ritually unclean or defiled. And so when you sent for me, I came without any objection. I ask you then, why did you send for me? Now, Peter and his traveling companions uh, make the 40-mile trip uh, north from Joppa, which is near present-day Tel Aviv in Israel, uh, up to Caesarea, 40 miles. Now, you could easily do that in a day. It'd be, it would be a long day. But, uh, so they, they break up the trip and spend the night somewhere along the way. Now, what we don't know is if the Jews stayed in the Holiday Inn and the Gentiles stayed in uh, the Econo Lodge. <laughs> or did they actually stay under the same... Same hotel. I'm going to ask Peter that someday. Where did, where did you guys sleep that night on the way up to Caesarea? Now, as he arrives at Cornelius' house, Cornelius comes out and falls at, his feet, as, at Peter's feet as if to worship him. But what does Peter do? He reminds him that he is just an ordinary human being and tells him to stand up and not treat him with any deference. Now, this is a very important point. Those of us who are preachers, and pastors, and professors, singers, we love it when people say, oh, what a great sermon that was. Oh, you sang so beautifully. And we sort of say, bring it on. We like it. We love it. It makes us feel really good. But that's not the Jesus way. The Jesus way is to deflect that and remind people, I'm just an ordinary human being. You know, that's what I love about how God calls us. God calls us ordinary people like you and like me to join God in God's mission. So if Peter says, don't treat me with any special kind of stuff, why do we always want to be treated so specially? Be served first, have some of the best food, ride the best cars. It's a part of our culture, isn't it? But it is it a biblical value? I don't think so. Now, when he gets into the house, he finds it packed with Cornelius' friends, neighbors, and relatives. And then he delivers the second punchline in this chapter when he reminds them that according to the law and cultural customs, Jews and Gentiles are not to mix. They're not to fraternize with one another, and they're certainly not to come into each other's homes. Here's what he says, verse 28. But God has shown me that I must not consider any person ritually unclean or defiled. You included. And now verses 30 to 33. So he asked the question, why did you send for me? Cornelius said, 
It was about this time, three days ago, that I was praying in my house about three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man dressed in shining clothes stood in front of me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers and has taken notice of your works of charity. Send someone to Joppa for a man whose full name is Simon Peter. He's a guest in the home of Simon, the tanner of leather, who lives by the sea. And so I sent for you at once, and you have been good enough to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God, waiting to hear anything that the Lord has instructed you to say. Wow, that's such a beautiful example of prevenient grace at work. How many people around the world are waiting for us to tell them what God wants to say to them? But we never go. We're all waiting here, knowing that God is going to say something to us through you. I think that must be happening all over the world. So Cornelius retells the story that we have just walked through, and now he waits in anticipation for what God is going to say to him and to those in the house through Peter's words. And now we're ready for scene five. Peter began to speak. I now realize that it's true that God treats everyone on the same basis. Those who fear him and do what is right are acceptable to him, no matter what race they belong to. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Lord of all. That was a very blasphemous thing to say. Everyone knew who was Lord. Who was Lord? Caesar was Lord. And now he's declaring, no, Jesus is Lord of all, not just Caesar. That was, that was a pretty gutsy thing to say because remember now, Cornelius is a soldier in the, in the uh, Roman army. And he's saying right in front of this Roman soldier, Caesar's not Lord, Jesus is Lord. Now you know of the great events that took place throughout the land of Israel, beginning in Galilee after John preached his message of baptism. You know about Jesus of Nazareth, and how God poured out on him the Holy Spirit and power. He went everywhere doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the land of Israel and in Jerusalem. Then they put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from death three days later and caused him to appear, now not to everyone, but only to the witnesses that God had already chosen. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from death. And he commanded us to preach the gospel to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets spoke about him, saying that all who believe in him will have their sins forgiven through the power of his name. This is interesting. <clears throat> this speech is the first recorded preaching of the, of the gospel to the Gentile world. Now, if this whole incident had not happened in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius, it's possible that this, this movement would have just stayed right inside Jewish captivity and never would have spread to the rest of the world. But here it is, the first recorded example of Peter, uh, of the good news being uh, preached uh, in the Gentile world. Now. Peter's cross-cultural conversion process is just about complete. Look what he says in verses 34 and 35. I now realize it's true that God treats everyone on the same basis. Gentiles are just as good as Jews. What does that have to say to us? Filipinos are just as good as Americans. Blacks are just as good as whites. Women are just as good as men. School dropouts are just as good as PhDs. Nurses are just as good as doctors. Students are just as good as professors. Professors are just as good as board members. Democrats are just as good as Republicans. Well, you're not sure about that. <laughs> it makes no difference. So if it makes no difference to God, how come we make such a big deal about it? It makes no difference. All that God requires <laughs> is that we acknowledge who he is and we do what pleases God. Wow, what a powerful statement. All God requires 
as the people fear him and do what is right. It makes no difference what culture they come from. And now we're ready for scene six. The Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit just as the Jews did. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who were listening to his message. The Jewish believers who had come from Joppa were with, uh, uh, with, with Peter, who were, were amazed that God had poured out his, spirit, his Holy Spirit on the Gentiles also. I need to read that again because that's so powerful. The Jewish believers who had come from Joppa with Peter were amazed that God had poured out his gift of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles also. They thought the gift of the Holy Spirit was just for them. And the shock of their life is the Holy Spirit was given to them, given to these Gentiles in the same way it had been given to them. For they heard them speaking in strange tongues and praising God's greatness. Peter spoke up. These people have received the Holy Spirit, just as we also did. Can anyone then stop them from being baptized with water? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay with them for a few days. Now this passage completes the process and confirms Peter's new cross-cultural awareness that God has no favorites. My goodness, he even gives the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles in the same way that he gave it to the Jews. Peter's cross-cultural conversion is complete. He fully understands that one may become a follower of Jesus without having to become culturally a Jew. That's the lesson of Acts chapter 10. One can become a follower of Jesus without having to become culturally a Jew. Now later in Acts chapter 15, they would debate this point and vote on it in the Jerusalem Council. I, I say that's the early church's first and most important business meeting. And the big issue was, can we let these Gentiles come into our church? And the Jerusalem Council made the right decision. Yes, they can. But unfortunately, we have had to keep relearning this principle at every era of the church's history. We have to keep relearning it. You see, we keep confusing spiritual conversion to Christ with cultural conversions to my lifestyle, to my language, to my values, to my worldview. We want people to become like Jesus, but we also want them to become like me. And we get it all mixed up. You see, the lesson, the lesson from Acts chapter 10 is so clear. We must be prepared to undergo a cross-cultural conversion along with our conversion to Christ if we're going to become effective missionaries, effective cross-cultural witnesses. A missionary needs two conversions. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.